Fountainhead is a 1949 film adaptation of Ayn Rand's 1943 novel of the same name. The film is directed by acclaimed filmmaker King Vidor, and its screenplay is written by Rand herself. Rand was quite critical of the end product, though, perhaps feeling disappointment by its negative reception. However, over time, it has undergone a critical reappraisal, with some hailing it as one of Vidor's best films. Writing for the Chicago Reader, film critic Dave Kerr argues the following. Vidor turned Ayn Rand's preposterous, philosophical novel into one of his finest and most personal films, mainly by pushing the phallic imagery so hard that it surpasses Rand's rightous diatribes. Furthermore, Contemporary philosopher Slavoj Žižek even considers it one of his favorite films, stating that it is ultra-capitalist propaganda, but it's so ridiculous that he cannot help but love it. But the mind is an attribute of the individual. There is no such thing as a collective brain. The man who thinks must think and act on his own. I agree with some of Kerr's sentiments and recognize where Žižek is coming from. In some ways, I think the film is so ridiculous and melodramatic that had I not known that Rand directly wrote the screenplay and intended to preach these messages, I would assume that this is something like satire. But more than likely, it's not meant to be. And there isn't anything here that directly or even indirectly critiques the ideological leanings of the character that can't simply be extrapolated by reading between the lines as a rational critical thinker. Above all else, I really just see this film as a beautiful romantic melodrama about creative passion, with incredible direction and editing. I really wasn't expecting to like this as much as I did, but here we are. Like the novel, the film follows architect Howard Rourke, played by Gary Cooper who fights for his individualist right to preserve his vision for modern architecture against the collective interest of the traditional establishment. Now there's a touch of the new and a touch of the old, so it's sure to please everybody. The middle of the road. Why take chances when you can stay in the middle? No. If you want my work, you must take it as it is or not at all. But why? A building has integrity, just like a man. Rourke refuses to compromise or surrender to the pressures of authorities, even going so far as to deny the lower class what he deems opportunities to leech. But it's a humanitarian project. Think of the people who live in slums. If you can give them decent housing, you perform a noble deed. Would you do it just for their sake? No. As expected, this film is heavily rooted in supporting Rand's view of radical capitalism and critics have argued that the film is a response to communism. Rand makes her philosophical case through an accessible story appealing to the pathos. And then visually, Vidor romanticizes the individual spirit, making for a blunt aesthetic case for individualism. Perhaps through a mythic straw man and obfuscation, though. Here's the thing. Even if many things in my life, my experiences, and my upbringing points to me finding Rand's politics highly objectionable, I also can't help but appreciate the craft behind this film. And that's kind of the point, isn't it? To present this idea in a palatable manner? People have asked me before if I think conservatives can make good art. Well, yes, I suppose. If we were to call Rand and Vidor conservative anyway. Vidor was a registered Republican, a Christian scientist, and a strong opponent to communism. While Rand would describe herself as a radical capitalist, and her views deviate from traditional U.S. conservatism, typically rooted in alleged Christian ethics. In fact, she opposed religion. So perhaps the better question would be, can the right wing make good art? But that would necessitate subscribing to the reductive, but sometimes useful, other times useless, left-right binary in politics. From a radical leftist perspective, any work of art promoting liberalism could even be considered a right-wing text. But regardless, my answer would still be yes, the right-wing can make good art. I don't think I even need to find myself in ideological alignment with an artist 
in order to admire their work. For better or for worse, as far as aesthetics go, I think the Fountainhead adaptation makes an emotional plea for Rand's ideas. And to be honest, it does make me think. Maybe in some ways, Ayn Rand was right. Not necessarily in her views of how people ought to think, but instead, how they already think. Perhaps she exploits something that people intuitively view as true. Those who reject the basic tenets of religion and theism, and in turn, consciously or unconsciously, embrace capitalist notions of individualism, tend to think in Randian-esque, objectivist terms regardless. That we as people are not and should not be indebted to a god, or to our social group, or to our fellow brother, or sister, or whatever. But instead, we are only indebted to ourselves. This is how people think, isn't it? It is an ancient conflict. It has another name. The individual against the collective. And when it comes to art, is it not individualist in some ways? Or are Rand and Vidor simply reading individualism into it? Should the author, the director, or the architect not have final say in how their work is made? In some ways, I can't help but empathize with this idea, especially when it comes to artists seemingly being screwed over by higher-ups. But at the same time, one should also recognize that art and architecture are made for the general public, right? So then should these higher-ups not have some say in the interest of preserving the wants and needs of the general public? If not them, then who? It is the unsacrificed self that we must respect in man above all. And where do we find it? In a man like Howard Rourke. Howard Rourke is both framed as the hero and the villain at the same time, depending on how you look at him. I mean, admittedly, his integrity is admirable in a disconnected and mythic kind of way. I think Vidor brings nuance to this blunt monstrosity, but at the same time, that could be me projecting. But I do think this is a Vidor film above a Rand one. And right there, we have two individuals, Vidor and Rand, working together, complementing each other, but ultimately, both are making individual personal statements. Vidor might express himself through Rand, but that's also Vidor asserting his voice over Rand's. I don't even think it's making an intellectual case for radical capitalism. After all, the characters are already born into a relative privilege, and even if Rourke resorts to manual labor for a brief period, there aren't any real significant consequences or tension arising from the potential betrayal of principles. And I don't think there is any real tangible truth to any of the characters' plights, besides a raw emotional one that speaks to our individualist and perhaps selfish intuition, where we feel a sense of catharsis at seeing Rourke win, because, in some ways, we see ourselves in him. People have criticisms of Rand's work, and not just ideologically, too. Many will say the flowery language that she uses in her books is pretentious, she's trying too hard, and it's ultimately poor writing all around. Shaming Rand's writing skills is not the strongest argument against her work's underlying philosophy, but some of her detractors will do so anyway. I guess in order to somehow affirm their disdain towards the woman and her politics, by invalidating her artistry. Perhaps it brings these self-described progressives more comfort to know that people they don't like aren't succeeding in conventional standards for what constitutes good literature. But what happens when a film adaptation goes above and beyond in its visual language and has strong aesthetics to support its supposedly negative message? Well, that's often when people will call it propaganda, opting, of course, for a rather flimsy definition of propaganda. It seems both Kerr and Jezik find value within the film for either going against Rand or against itself ideologically. But my question in turn is if this necessarily has to be the case in order for the work of art to be good. After all, a vast majority of great films produced in Hollywood are hardly radical, and have a fairly safe liberal message to them that is accessible and agreeable all around. It's hardly a controversial risk. And then what about directors working under oppressive role, where they have no choice but to either produce propaganda, actual propaganda, or to abandon artistry altogether? Can a film not be good for how it presents its message, regardless of the ethics of its message? This all assumes that we take the good and evil dichotomy seriously, of course. Even if objective quality and art exist, 
we still may not be able to make an agreeable case for how we can determine and measure it, and how much moral, ethical, and political alignment with the work factors into this, if it even does at all. That's not to say we shouldn't strive for some kind of model to judge art by, but we should just recognize this kind of thing is untrustworthy. Now, I don't even find The Fountainhead to be the most egregious film by any means. Meanwhile, there are films that I would consider evil, but paradoxically can't help but find artistic value within them. And in the case of something like Lenny Riefenstahl's Olympia films, there's also a factor of finding fascination in history and learning from it. What I consider good art really becomes nullified at that point. And maybe when you enter the realm of actively hateful films, you can say, yeah, no, that is just indefensible. But even seemingly little things normalized in culture at a given period of time contribute to the systems of oppression. And art often just reflects that, while simultaneously passively reinforcing it. Furthermore, if it wasn't the birth of a nation that filled the role that it did in the mid-1910s, it was bound to be something else. Griffith's film was the obvious poster child for the problems at hand that manifested throughout all corners of media at the time, and since. So even if morally there's a point where you should draw the line in what you categorize as quality art, I think we should also approach art on less dogmatic terms. I would rather use art to learn about the world, different cultures, different religions, different political points of view, so that I can better understand my position in relationship to others, and maybe at times reconsider and reassess my own viewpoints. Ultimately, at this point of time, I do think that King Vidor's film adaptation of The Fountainhead succeeds as a film and as a work of art. Whether this is good or bad that it does is another question, but it succeeds in part because of the way in which it romanticizes its ideas, presenting them in a palpable manner that speaks to us as individuals, where one can't help but be seduced by its charm, and in turn, for better or for worse, find something to cherish within it. Even if this is all for a fleeting moment. Special thanks to my patrons, Werner Saz, Claire, Greg, Adam Young, Yaka Rajanoi, Sophie Pilbium, Picadon, and Wolfgang. If you like what I do, please like, subscribe, and share my work around. If you really like what I do, want to see your name included in future videos, as well as gain early access to new content, consider donating to my Patreon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Would you do it just for their sake? No.